for being you. Thank you, Father, for being the air that we breathe. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Good evening and welcome to Balance Point if you came in a little bit late. We want to just soak a little bit in the glory and the presence of God Almighty. Oh, thank you, Lord. Well, we also fix our tech. First off, we want to welcome you to Balance Point. If this is your first time visit, we just pray that you will uh, find this time with us edifying and that uh, you will um, enjoy the time in the Word. Now it's time for our uh, weekly announcements. If you <laughs> are in the Southern California area, we would love to have you join us here at Live Worship. Now the glorious thing about where God has placed us is we are right exactly in the middle of Southern California. I mean literally. If you are anywhere within the Southern California area, believe it or not, you are no more than an hour away from us. Especially on a Sunday night. Especially on a Super Bowl night. There ain't nobody out on the road to get in your way. But you know what's better than Super Bowl night? It's any night that we can go up to the house of the Lord. And so we would like to invite you to come and worship with us. All we ask that you do if you'd like to come and worship with us live is shoot us an email at staff at bounce-point.org. That's staff at bounce-point.org. We'll give you instructions for how to get here. We'll give you some tips on where to park. As you can tell, we do not meet in a traditional church. We actually meet in a private home. And um, so we want to be kind to our neighbors. And we want to be a good witness to our neighbors by not overwhelming the area with a lot of people. So we do limit how many people can come to live worship with us uh, as a matter of consideration for the parking situation where we're located. If you're catching this on YouTube as a post-recording, we'd like to invite you to join us for live worship in our worship center. I'm sorry, our virtual sanctuary. Words, I have trouble with them. Come join us in our virtual sanctuary at balance-point.churchonline.org. That's balance-point.churchonline, all one word, dot org. There we have a virtual sanctuary where we can gather together to worship. Just because you are watching this through a screen does not mean that you should be cut off from the experience of communal worship. The word tells us that we should not forsake the gathering together with the brothers. Now back in the day, before the advent of technology, that meant that your church was someplace geographically located that you could get to it. But with today's technology, your church is where you gather together. Whether that is physically, by coming here to Southern California and coming to a worship service, or whether that is virtually. The point is we gather together as a community. We would love to have you join us for worship. Nextly, if you do not have a church home, if you are a Christ follower, if you are a believer that Jesus died for your sins, you should be part of a church home. And if you don't have a church home, we would like to invite you to consider making Balance Point your church home. Whether you're able to come to the service live here in Southern California, or whether you uh, are attending the service via the live stream, we would love to to be able to serve you and to be able to minister to you. We would also love to have your gifts available to the body. You see, the funny thing about Balance Point is 
you know, you see me in front of the camera. You see me coming through your computer screen or your Roku screen or, or your smart TV or your satellite phone. Just to name a few ways that people have mentioned that they connect a balance point. And you see me. And it looks like it's just one person. But you need to know something about balance points. There are many people that require to take to put uh, balance point service together. We have ministers in our virtual sanctuary. We have musicians here locally. You know, we have. Uh, we're hoping to add someone to help us with uh, the technology and the video switching. <coughs> but each of you has been given a gift by God, multiple gifts. And you should be plugged into a church home where you can use those gifts. Maybe your gift is leading, interceding, counseling. Well, because Bounce Point is a non-traditional church, most of our ministry happens in a small group setting. And so we are always on the lookout for mature and maturing Christians who can lead a small group, who can be a, a local minister to a small group of 5, 10, 20 people. Because that's where real ministry happens. Even if we were a traditional church with a building and offices and all of that, guess what? There's only so much that a single pastor, even even if you had a staff of ten pastors, there's only so much that those pastors can do. There's only so many people that those pastors can serve. And so we need your gifts. We need your talents here at Balance Point. So consider making Balance Point your church home. And now today we're going to continue in our study on, whoa, restoration. Now you see why we need somebody to help us with technology. <laughs> or if you haven't seen it yet, you will soon. So we began a study on restoration. And the study on restoration came out of the um, pillars of the foundations of Balance Point. Those foundations are the Word. We're people of the Word here at Balance Point. Worship. We are people who worship God. And working. We are people who are not just hearers of the word, but we are doers of the word. And the goal of the word and the worship and the working is restoration. Restoration. What does that mean? It means to be brought back. to the original condition of. You see, God is a restoring God. And so, we looked at restoration in general. And now we're going to look at and God as the restorer. And this week we want to look at the restoration of the relationship between a holy, righteous, sinless God and fallen sinful man. And so we're going to be looking at that. have to stretch a little bit here. In terms of God as the restorer of man. Now for us to really get into what God God is restorer of man. We got to understand where we came from. You see, when God made man, God said this about man. God said, watch this, all the way back in the beginning, Genesis chapter 131. God saw all that he had made. 
And by this time, God had made everything. He had made the heavens, the earth, all the plants, all the animals. And man, God saw everything that he made. And it was very good. Now, it's interesting that the author of Genesis did not say, and God saw everything that he made, and it was perfect. Because, see, if it had been perfect, there'd be no reason for man to tend the garden. But no, God made everything very good so that we might be partakers in God's creative nature. And so God created everything that was needed, everything that was necessary to be created. And then he gave man the command to take what he, God, had made and make it useful. But what God had made was very good. The second thing that we need to understand about how we were made was that we were made with the capacity to think and to choose. That is what makes mankind different from all the other animals. The other animals function based on instinct. Stimulus response, stimulus response, stimulus response. But man was created in the image of God. And God only gave two classes of beings the ability to think and the ability to choose. The first class of being that God gave the ability to think and choose were the angels. And the other group that God gave the ability to think and to choose is mankind. Humankind. And we know that because we were created in God's image. But further, we know that because of the command that God gave to the man in Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. The Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. Watch this. Mankind was free to choose. He could choose whatever he was going to eat. That's just a, a, a small microcosm of the e immense privilege that God has given to us. You know, the, the most beautiful thing that God could do to man is allow him to think and to choose. The most dangerous thing that God could do to man is allow him to think and choose. And we know that we have valid choice because our choices have consequences. That's the, that's the other thing we need to know. Our choices have consequences. Genesis chapter 2, picking up the very next verse, verse 17. But you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. In other words, God left it up to man to choose whether he was going to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But there was a valid consequence. If you don't eat from this tree, you will live. If you do eat from this tree, you will die. You see... For a choice to be valid, there has to be a consequence to that choice. There has to be a true consequence. You know, uh, in, in 10 days, my wife and I will be celebrating our 25th anniversary. And a couple of years before that, I had proposed to my wife. 
The choice to propose was my choice. The choice for her to say yes or no was her choice. And there was a valid consequence for each choice. Yes, we get married. No, we don't. So for choices to be valid, there must be a consequence. Last thing we need to know about where we were was we were made for relationship with God. God made humankind because he loved us. Not only did he love us, he loved us before he ever created us. I want you to think about that. I want you to imagine that. Before there was space, before there was time, before there was matter, God had decided that he loved you. That's mind-blowing. Jeremiah 31.3. Now this is referring to the people of Israel, but this is also referring to everybody that God has ever created. The Lord appeared to us in the past saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. Isn't that, a, isn't that the description of the God that we serve? He loved us with an everlasting love. How big is the Father's love? His love is as far as the east is from the west. How big is God's love? God's love is so big that it's encompassed by arms that were stretched out on a cross. And the amazing thing is, he loved us even knowing that we would reject him. So that's where we were. We were loved by God. We were made with the capacity to think and to choose. We were made very good. But what happened? Sin came into the world. What sin? Sin is nothing more than missing the mark. Sin is missing the expectations of God. And here's the thing about sin. We are all sinners. You see, the world would have you believe that there is good, better, and best. There's, there, there's some bad people, some not quite so bad people, some neutral people, some good people, some not so good people, some good people, and some really good saintly people. But God says differently. There is no good, better, or best. Because we're all in the same boat. I don't care whether you're Mother Teresa or whether you're Hitler. We're all in the same boat in God's eyes. Romans 3.22 There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. There is no difference. Now, Paul writing here was writing about the, the distinctions between Jews and Gentiles. But later on he goes to say, in the very next verse, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You see, we're all in the same boat because we are all flawed. Some of us are less flawed than others, but we are still all flawed. And those flaws are what separate us from God. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. See, God loves us, but our sin, our missing the mark, separates us. It causes us to not be able to have the communion with God that God desires to have with each of us. See, a holy God cannot be in the presence of sin. And because of that, 
we cannot be in his presence. But see, if the story ended there, we'd be in a world of hurt. In fact, we'd be beyond, be beyond a world of hurt. We'd be like, ooh, we'd be in a world of oogly. Okay, we, I, I mean, I'm talking seriously, oogly. But God loved us. And so though we sin, God set about restoring us so that we might be with him forever. So how does God restore us? First thing we have to know about the restoration that God provides is the restoration that he provides flows out of his love. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. God loves you. God loves me. And because of that, he works to restore us. But see, here's the thing. We, in the 21st century, have a warped idea of what love is. We think of love as some ooey-gooey, squishy emotion. I mean, we're sitting here in February. This is the month of Valentine's Day when, when you get all the candy and the pink cards and, and, and the Cupid angels. And, 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 and we think of love as romantic. And, and by the way, there is a kind of love that is romantic. But God's love isn't a romantic love. God's love is a righteous love. God's love is a holy love. You see, a romantic love says, I will love you as long as you love me back. God's love says, I will love you even though you hate me. Romantic love says, I will love you as long as you look fine. God's love says, I love you even when you were down in the slime. So God restores us based on love. God restores us based on seeking that which is best for us. But the problem was that we owed a debt. We owe to debt. Because you see, here's the thing. When we sin, we sell ourselves into slavery. We sell ourselves into the slavery of following the flesh. We sell ourselves into the slavery of sensuality. We sell ourselves into the slavery of intellectuality. Now, that's not to say that when you come to the Lord, you check your brain at the door. In fact, if you try that around here at Balance Point, you're going to be showed the door. Because we are thinking believers. God doesn't say check your brain at the door. God says taste and see that the Lord is good. God doesn't say check your brain at the door. He says come and reason with me. See, God's not afraid to be questioned. But the challenge is there's a debt that we owe because of sin. We owe a debt to our Creator. Because in sinning, we have stolen something very precious from Him, and that is ourselves. And so when Jesus taught His disciples the model, the model prayer, He taught them to ask, and forgive us our debts, forgive us our sins. As we forgive our debtors, as we forgive those who have fallen short of us. See, we owe God a debt 
But even worse than that, we owe God a debt that we cannot pay. After all, how can a finite human being who's basically dust and water and a little bit of breath who lives for maybe 70, 80 years on this plane of existence and then it dies and goes back to dust. How can we puny little humans ever repay a holy, eternal, omniscient, omnipresent God? A holy God set apart. A God that is set apart. Eternal God that goes from forever in the past to forever in the future. A God that exists outside of time. Omnipresent. A God who is everywhere at all times. Omnip omnipotent. A God who can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, wherever he wants, however he wants. How do we repay something like that we can't in fact Jesus tells a parable about it therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants as he began the settlement a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold that's a lot of gold was brought to him since he was not able to pay the master ordered that he his wife and his children all that he had be sold to repay the debt. We are that man that owes God owes so much and yet we cannot pay. But we can do what the servant did. At this the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. Well, his first mistake was believing he could pay back everything. 10,000 bags of gold you ain't paying that back, homie. The servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. Now, there's more to that parable, but I want you to consider this. That servant owed the master, and he couldn't pay. And the servant offered to try to pay, but the master felt sorry for him. See, that's us. Apart from what God does for us through his son Jesus, we run around trying to pay. Whether it's going up on a mountain to meet with some guru, whether it's beating ourselves bloody, whether it's praying five times a day pointed in some special direction, that's just mankind trying to pay. Trying to pay. But we can't. Have you ever noticed how <clears throat> after you do one of these great things that you that you think you're doing because um, because you know it, it, it will get you some merit with God? How after you're done with that thing, you just feel empty? In fact, you probably feel worse than before you started it. That's because there's a hole that we can't fill. And only Jesus can fill the hole. Only God can fill that hole. Only the infinite can fill that hole. So if we can't pay, who pays? Because, see, God is also a God of justice. And God said that, well, you know what? Since you can't pay, I'm going to send my son to pay. And that's amazing. See, I don't know that I could give up my son for another person's life. And yet God does that very thing for us.
I make mistakes, even though I fall short, even though I head off in the wrong direction, you love me. Father, I can't pay you what I owe you. All I can do is accept the gift of your son, the life that he gave on my behalf. And so, Father God, I ask that you would forgive me. Send your Holy Spirit to live in me so that I might live a life pleasing to you. And I thank you, Father God, for doing that. In the name of your son, Jesus, amen and amen. Now, if you have prayed that prayer and you meant that prayer, I want you to take the next step because the word says that if you will confess Jesus before man, he will confess you before the angels in heaven. Another passage says that where two or more come into agreement about a thing here on earth that shall be established. I'm one, you're one. I want to come into agreement with you about the fact that you have been saved, that you have been restored. And accomplishing that is as simple as shooting me an email at staff at balance-point.org. That's staff at balance-point.org. In the subject line of the email, put restored. And when you do that, I will know that that's why you're emailing me. And I will come into agreement with you about your restoration. Amen? Amen. Once again, I want to invite you, if you don't have a church home, go to our ministry center. Register there. That does not make you a member of Balance Point, but what that does is that tells me that you want more information about who we are, what we believe. We'll get that information to you, set up a time when we can either voice chat, video chat, meet live over coffee here locally. So you can learn what Balance Point is about. And if you still want to become part of the Balance Point family, you'd be more than welcome to. But doing that is as simple as going to our ministry center, www.balance-point.org. Register up and I will get in contact with you. Next week we will be looking at another aspect of, of restoration. And that's restoration of ourselves. We, we've looked at restoring the relationship between God and man. But that's just the first step. Once that step is taken, God will begin to restore a whole bunch of other stuff. So we're going to next look at the restoration of the image that God created you in. So, until next time, prepare to receive the blessing. In the name of the Father, who made you and makes a way of restoration for you. In the name of the Son, who paid the price of restoration on our behalf. And in the name of the Holy Spirit who seals us in a restored life. Go in peace and the joy of your restoration. Until next week.